Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, because uh, of course we're holding this online, so we know people are joining us uh, from everywhere, and welcome. Welcome to, um, I'm very excited to, to be here at the first um, of our ALC research seminars, the African Leadership Center research seminars in the new academic year. This is research seminar 10. Um, and we are very uh, excited that we're going to be hearing today uh, from uh, Clement uh, Sefanyako uh, about the transitional complexities of petroleum governance in Ghana. Now, uh, Clement's presentation is going to shine a spotlight on petroleum governance in Ghana and will depart from a typical, I think many of us are familiar with this, a typical tendency to the natural resource uh, curse discourse and thesis, especially when considering African context. Instead, Clement is going to be focusing on drivers of governance frameworks in Ghana, um, emphasizing, of course, the petroleum uh, sector. Um, his work here draws on findings of extensive research that has used um, an anthropological concept of liminality and thinking about uh, transition. So I think we're very, I'm certainly very excited to hear a bit more um, about that. Um, and a lot of his central argument is going to be um, reflecting on uh, the notion idea of how contentious politics and political settlements um, have sort of influenced or interacted with the predictability or the clearly stated objectives in the phases of petroleum governance in, in Ghana. So I'll say a little bit, a few words about, about Clement. Uh, Clement has 10 years of experience in critical social uh, assessments in Sub-Saharan Africa. His research has focused on social determinants of political stability, um, and he's currently also completing an extensive body of research to reframe the natural resource curse discourse in Ghana. He's done a lot of this work at La Trobe University in Australia, and he joins us from Australia uh, right now. Um, a lot of his research critically assesses political behavior and institutions that inform options for natural resource exploitation um, in parts of Africa. Um, and so, of course, we're going to be hearing some of that work today. Um, of course, it's very exciting to, to note that Clement is also an alumnus of the African Leadership Center's uh, Scholars Program. He has two previous master's um, uh, degrees as well, from King's, uh, one from King's College uh, London. So it's really great um, to be hearing from him. Now, um, speaking uh, in response to, to Clement's presentation, we're going to be hearing from Kafui Sekbo, who um, is a research associate at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, um, and also a PhD candidate um, with the South African Research Chair in Social Policy and the Department of Sociology at the University of South Africa. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's a distinct pleasure to be here and to be able to welcome uh, these colleagues to, to speak to us uh, today. I'll encourage you to please um, hold on to questions. I think we, we should have a, a space here. We have a Q&A um, uh, uh, spot uh, on, the, on your screen. So please, as the questions come to you, feel free to deposit those questions um, into the Q&A uh, function. Uh, and I'll pick up on those um, when we come uh, to the end of the presentation and our discussions um, remarks as well. Um, before we welcome Clement, let me just take advantage of having your attention here with us to say on the 22nd of November, we will have our next uh, research seminar where we'll be focusing on uh, leadership, nation building and war in South Sudan. We'll be hearing from Dr. Sonia Theron from the University of Pretoria, who's also an, an alumna with the African Leadership Center, um, and she'll be uh, sharing with us. Um, on that subject, drawing uh, from her recent book that has been published um, uh, with the Bloomsbury Press, um, the Peace Society and the State in Africa uh, book series um, as well. So we're very excited that we'll be welcoming um, uh, Sonia to, to speak to us in November. Without further ado, let me uh, um, invite Clement, please. 
to join us and please share um, from his fascinating research. Um, and, you know, I look forward to all the reflections that will follow that. Clement, thank you so much for joining us. Um, over to you, please. Um, thanks so much, Eka. It's, uh, it's an ab absolute pleasure to be part of this conversation. Um, can you hear me all right, everyone? Okay. Um, so look, it, 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 um, this is really a very good opportunity for me to speak about the research I do in the uh, petroleum governance sector in Ghana. And um, obviously the, the excitement is also because the ALC does very important things in um, governance and leadership in Africa. And so this study really connects to that, that very well. Um, I would like to state from the outset now that um, this presentation emanates from an extensive research that involved um, interviewing um, about 100 um, experts and civil society activists in Ghana, but also people who live in petroleum communities um, in coastal um, regions of Ghana. And so you can appreciate that most of the discussions will be informed by Live people's lived experiences, um, but also assess through the literature to understand um, those complexities that um, have afflicted Ghana's um, petroleum governance. Um, so that's the um, the you know the the, the mindset and the the, um, the origins of this conversation. But I also want to emphasize that um, today's discussion. Um, we'll, we'll speak about a range of factors that have influenced Ghana's um, transitions into petroleum, petroleum governance and the uniqueness of Ghana's experience. Um, this is done against the backdrop um, of resource scarce theory that assumes that all countries in the global south that have natural resources, such as gold, diamond, and crude oil, um, will suddenly become vulnerable to the um, commercial exploitation. Um, just because resources are there. And that's a question that we are familiar with and we need to keep exploring. So I'll answer this question um, through Ghana's experience and will argue that despite all the challenges with the transitions of um, petroleum governance, um, the, the challenges with uh, leadership, the challenges with political um, settlement issues and contentious politics, um, the challenge, the, the problem of Ghana's resource sector, it's not a natural resource case problem. It is rather an institutional design problem, um, which I'll, I'll spend some time to speak to you about that, um, uh, about that phenomenon. In the meantime, um, I categorize Ghana's history of petroleum governance um, in three phases. And I'll spend a few moments to go through each of them for you um, at this moment. Now, um, before 1983, which is, um, sorry, I think this thing is covering the screen. Before 1983, which is the, um, the period where I have set the modern history of Ghana's exploration of petroleum, there, was, there were a few unsuccessful attempts to um, get petroleum in commercial quantities in Ghana, but most of them failed. It started in the 1970s, especially when Nigeria started exploring um, and, and producing petroleum. Ghana showed interest, but by 1979, there was no evidence of um, petroleum production in commercial quantities. And so most of the multinational companies left Ghana. But um, certain um, elements, certain um, socio-political factors led Ghana to venture into petroleum governance. Now I'll go into some of those factors um, briefly in a moment, but for now, I would categorize Ghana's phase of petroleum history into three. The first phase was between 1983 and 2000, when the government at the time um, thought it wanted to have petroleum, regardless of whether multinationals were successful or not. And so the government decided to establish a petroleum infrastructure, set up um, the law to govern the petroleum sector, establish the national petroleum company, and then started funding petroleum activities through national budget without foreign investment. Of course, th there was an intent to invite foreign capital 
but foreign investment was not the government's priority. And so, for instance, it set up a, a, an arrangement that said any multinational that wanted to invest in Ghana would have to share up to 65% of yeah. its profit to the government. And um, obviously that wasn't attractive. And um, so it didn't really bring in a lot of foreign capital. And it didn't look that the government cared anyway at the time, um, at the PNDC government era. So that government ended in 2000. And then in 2001, a new government came in and suddenly changed, not suddenly, you know, strategically changed its intent towards attracting foreign capital. And that was a time, for instance, that it decided to bring down um, the, the profit share from 65% set to the previous era to about uh, between 10% and 15%. And so when the first discovery was made, because there was a lot of capital coming in, um, for instance, Ghana had just about 10% of um, um, profit from the petroleum find um, because of that deliberate political um, ap ap appetite to get money in, but also to, to keep the system flowing with capital. Um, one point that's worth noting during the second phase is that the, the government, even though we negotiated some of the agreements um, with multinationals and decided to bring down um, the, the proportion that comes to Ghana, um, the government still relied on the old laws that were established in the first phase. Those laws at this time, because foreign capital was coming in, was quite outdated, were quite outdated, but it, it didn't look like that was a priority in terms of reforming the law. Um, so that allowed you know, multinationals to have many loopholes in their system, which I'll speak about as we go ahead. Um, so there was a discovery of you know, commercial quantities of petroleum in 2007, partly because the government really attracted foreign capital with its um, policies and programs. That changed the dynamics in Ghana from 2008, you know, now from 2009, because there was a change in government at the time. Between 2009 and 2016, there was civil society involvement. Prior to this, because the sector wasn't really quite viable, people didn't see money coming in. Um, there was, you know, it was really quite opaque and um, you know, public interest was not that high. And so, but then that changed when there was a discovery in 2007. And then there was a change in government in 2009. So suddenly there was like, this public interest, some euphoria around um, the money that was coming into the sector civil society groups around the petroleum sector emerged. Um, and there was some advocacy to get laws established, to get revenue managed properly. Um, but then the challenge then at the time in 2009, for instance, the third phase, was that there was a lot of focus on revenue management, but not on the contracting and the exploration where a lot of the contracting was happening. People were more interested in the money that was coming in. So that changed the focus a little bit and, and until there was a change in law in 2016, when the first Petroleum Exploration and Production Act was repealed and replaced with the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act in 2016, the focus really was not on the holistic landscape, having accountability in the holistic landscape of petroleum governance in Ghana. But that's, you know, that's part of the challenges that I'll speak about today. So that third phase, really important to keep an eye on. But then when there was a closure in that whole cycle of getting the, the, the main law on petroleum exploration and production amended, um, uh, no, re repealed in 2016, there was a certain sense in which a, a, an entire cycle of Ghana's petroleum history had ended. And so from 2017, the dynamics changed as well, where you had, um, uh, some predictability in the sector because then there were laws around revenue that came in. There were laws around the contracting phase. There were laws in both the upstream and downstream phases of petroleum governance. And civil society and the international community need, knew what, what, what to expect in the sector. So um, that's the, uh, the, the sense I wanted to, um, you, know, the, you know, the phases I wanted to um, encapsulate at this point. Now, in terms of um, where this all fits, um, 
in governance, um, the phases. I, before I go into each of the phases, would like to um, speak to what an ideal governance framework should look like. In that light, there are certain principles that govern what I refer to as an institutional design framework. So, and I will liken this to the petroleum sector as we go along, but that's just the foundation. So, um, what, what do I mean by an institu institutional design, which I'm going to liken to the petroleum sector soon? I, I would say, um, per the literature and per the ex extensive research that I've done, um, I, it's, it's, it's institutional design really is an intentional attempt to establish norms and political processes and practices um, in, in, a, in, a, in a sector. Now, for this to be relevant, there has to be certain principles. And if you want to measure whether any governance framework, framework is sustainable and viable, you would want to measure them against these principles. Uh, the first principle is that um, every institution should be revisable because of the tendency um, for social change to bring about certain needs um, for there to be um, revisions and um, um, uh, changes um, to, to, to principles. If any institution doesn't have those reversibility, there's certainly a challenge to be, to be spoken, to, so spoken about. Um, then you would want to be sure that institutions are also robust, such that um, they don't just change when circumstances change, but that they only change when the underlying principles that govern the, the, the institution changes. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. Um, then institutions should be sensitive to motivational complexities. And what do I mean by motivational complexities? The um, in personal and group aspirations often class with objective aspirations. And so there has to be a certain balancing act that happens where institutions respond to all um, realities um, in, in any context. So you have uh, minority groups, majority groups, political interests, civil society interests. That sensitivity to each of those interests is very important for any institution to be viable. Um, then there's also this principle that people would often um, defend what defend in public what they assume to be good. And then, it, so if people do something bad, they want to hide that. And pe if people do something good, they want to publicize it. Now the Kantian public publicity principle, which is part of those uh, principles of institutional design I'm arguing for, suggests that if the, the public keep an eye on office holders, they would usually do what is good because that's what they can proclaim and defend in public. And things they cannot defend in public, they will desist from, from doing them. That means that the civil society, the public, have vested interest in governance because they would want to keep an eye. And the more they monitor and keep things in the public, the more uh, office holders begin to act appropriately. Um, there's also another principle that suggests that um, um, institutions should be variable, meaning that one every aspect of public institutions should have connection with other aspects so that the best can be learned from those different dimensions of institutions. So if you have, um, let's say, uh, federalism is usually a very good example of uh, variability of institutions. So if one federal state is doing something good, even though it's in, uh, quasi independent, um, some states may want to learn from those good things. And that's what institutions should also nurture, um, um, adopting the best of the lot um, in the system. Um, usually we talk about institutions as institutional design as if they are intentional designs, but usually institutions can emerge unintentionally. And so you'd have, um, informal laws emerging, but when they emerge, um, they have to be uh, governed into a space where people would have to determine their longevity and the quality of those institutions. And so those are just some, a few principles of what an ideal institution should look like. 
But there are also some assumptions of an, what an ideal institution should look like. These assumptions um, bother on, uh, I hope this is hiding somewhere, yeah, bother on two main legs, you know, um, agents of behavior should be willing to collaborate and should be willing to cooperate. And there are a few assumptions around there. Um, for instance, that people would respond to opportunities and incentives when they are exposed to them. And that if you vary opportunities and incentives, people's behavior will change. Um, to the extent to which this is true, determine the quality of institutions. Um, the other bit about uh, cooperation, the, the first leg of it, is that um, sanctions, which are like punishments and rewards, would often regulate behavior. And so if you have an institution that doesn't have sanctions inbuilt, it means behavior would often not be altered by um, anything because there'll be no sanctions there to govern behavior. Um, collaboration is also an important dimension of institutional design because you would want to, there are two main things that define collaboration here. That the first is that there, there's often an agreement between various parties to an institution, which could be anyone, it could be the state agents, could be society's agents, anyone who has interest, vested interest in institutions, that there's a certain agreement over what is valuable and virtue. And so th there should be some agreement for a law to, to, be, to have legitimacy that if you go to the law court, for instance, that the judge will have equity as a foundation to the decision making, that a prosecutor will not go and defend a thief when they know very well that a thief is a thief. You know, those kinds of agreement of our value should be fundamental to what an institution should be. Um, there's also a final thing about collaboration I would like to mention that if you put filters in place, filters, you can look at filters as conditionalities or um, yeah, anything. If you, if you put filters in place, those filters, which you can understand this as conditionalities, will alter people's choices and not their behavior. And so election can be a good filter, for instance. So if, if people know elections are coming, they would make choices that will be often in the best interest of the people and not in, in, in ways that undermine uh, the, the, the larger public interest. So those are assumptions that underpin institu um, institutions, which I wanted to highlight. But the question then that we need to ask is, does Ghana's design of the petroleum sector reflect these institutional design principles and assumptions? It's a yes or, it's a yes or no um, answer, but I'll get to that. Um, in a bit. For now, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Ghana's petroleum sector emerged in moments of liminality. And I'll define liminality in a moment. It, it imagine moments of liminality, which you can understand as a transition, you know, the transitions in life, if you look at it that way. But I'll briefly go into that in a, in a moment. It, because at the time, um, Ghana was really struggling to make ends meet. Basically, um, the political, social political landscape was in, in a catastrophic um, moment because, um, as you can see from the screen here, the um, minimum wage index was at its minimum, but inflation was so high that society was almost collapsing and the government needed to act to salvage the political environment. Now, in 1983, when this was, the country was at its low in terms of everything political and economic and social, the government was looking for options to salvage the economy. One option was that it went to the IMF and the World Bank for an economic recovery program. That was at the time that structural adjustment program also um, was introduced in Ghana. One of the options the government was looking at as well was this petroleum sector that suddenly was somehow of interest and the government had a lot of interest in that. And I spoke with some um, analysts and uh, polit political um, uh, scientists uh, on this. And this is 
one view that expresses the point I'm trying to make that definitely this happened at a time when um, the petroleum came at a time when you know the government was in desperate need for to, to balance its you know uh, balance of payments and you know, the IMF program couldn't salvage everything so petroleum became one of the um, the options on the table which um, everyone appreciated that was the point and so it, there was no question of whether institutions will be established appropriately to get um, systems functioning it was more about let's get petroleum onto the table and there was another perspective that was expressed which i found very profound in terms of um the the, the leadership of the petroleum sector at the time which was um led by a certain a certain Chikata, who was the, the first chief executive officer of, of uh, the Ghana Asa Petroleum Corporation that was established. Now, this person was a legal um, advisor and a counsel for the president at the time when he was being tried um, for attempted coup earlier on. And so they had a very profound personal relationship that the data suggests that drove the sector rather than even political interest or a need to get systems functioning. So that, that, that's something also to keep on the table, that it was liminal, it was a, a period of transition, because this was a time that the nature of the state was like that. And I, like I said, I'll explain briefly what liminality means, and then you can bring that into pers perspective. I'll keep an eye on this one. But the the challenge was not only just the question of Ghana, the wider context of the Gulf of Guinea and Africa in the 1970s and 1980s also determined how the sector emerged. And so this was a time when it was clear that Nigeria had significant deposits of petroleum. And there was some geological evidence to suggest that Ghana would also have substantial deposits. It was just a question of when, when the discovery happens and not if, you know. So that drive was there. So the government was really, you know, had the intent to pump in a lot of capital. So that Nigeria boom was one driver, which was like the focus, um, the, 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 the main driver, not the intent to establish institutions. There was also this whole geopolitics of the end of the Cold War, new alliances emerging, you know, the 1970s crude oil strategies that made it very difficult for countries to manage their um, petroleum supply. And so that became like, if countries are struggling, I mean, countries that have crude oil appeared to be safe somehow. And so everyone was trying to understand, to, 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 to secure its own hold on petroleum um, exploration. And because Ghana, was in at a stage where it knew it could explore this space, it fast tracked that whole agenda. But there was also just the appetite of China, for instance, which was an emerging global um, global power, which needed more food, more petroleum to feed its its economy. And then this third scramble for Africa at the time in West Africa because of the potential, but also because the US, the, the EU. China all had interest in there. So every country wanted to tap into that um, political capital there. Now, the question that I asked previously, I, I, we can return to that in terms of liminality. I have argued that um, Ghana's sex for petroleum and its um, exploration of petroleum was driven by liminality so what is liminality? And that liminality is simply it's an anthropological term, really, which really looks at the transitions in life. And so um, when young boy, when young girls and young boys are transitioning from being boys to um, adolescents, for instance, that period of uncertainty, that period of um, crisis is what we define as liminal, liminality. And so I'm transposing this into the space of Ghana's um, petroleum um, appetite to say Ghana at the time of setting up the petroleum sector 
was in moments of crisis and confusion and simply didn't have a strategy but needed it, you know, needed to have petroleum coming in. But that liminal movement did not end when the petroleum sector was established in 1983. In my analysis and um, examination of the data and the history of Ghana's petroleum sector, the period between 1983 and 2016 is a cycle of liminality such that post 2016, there was some high degree of predictability and certainty in the sector which was a departure from the deep liminal moment between 1983 and 2016. Um, and I'll explain why, why that is the case. Now, if, um, so, yeah, so at least we, we, we understand why I'm saying Ghana's petroleum sector between 1983 and 2016 was liminal, because that was a period where there were many things happening which didn't look like there was a strategy, there was a plan. Let me show you the features I found across all three phases, which you know, um, make them liminal. And in the next slide, I, I will show you how each of the phases has its unique characteristics, but these ones really have cross-cutting um, dynamics in there. Now, um, already by, 1996, when the sector was still struggling, there, there was a lot of capital being pumped into the sector, which made it almost impossible for the state to survive. Um, the, the state was struggling to meet its domestic needs, but it was still pumping in a lot of capital. And yet the government um, agreed to the hedging of petroleum um, to certain um, capital markets that made Ghana lose a lot of money. Um, Chachichikata at the time um, had, when there was a change in government in 2001, that was when this came into light, that um, Societe General said Ghana was owing it about $20 million at the time because of some of the risky um, financial transactions. For instance, um, the GMPC wanted to, the Ghana Nasa Petroleum Corporation, wanted to um, use the export of cocoa um, from Ghana to international market as um, a basis to import crude oil into Ghana, uh, petroleum into Ghana. But that whole transaction was so murky that it became too expensive. And there are even some um, um, evidence that the finance minister at the time, for instance, des deserted the post because he simply couldn't manage the, the, the losses in the sector and yet the government's interest in the sector. But that's explained by the personal relationship between um, Rollins at the time and the then um, CEO of Ghana Nasa Petroleum Corporation. Um, there was, let me look for some other um, characteristics of the sector that probably interesting. Um, so when there was a change in government in 2000, and I'm look, looking at the whole period between 1983 in 2016, and picking some of the factors that suggest this arbitrariness, the liminality in the sector, um, that confusion of identity and non-predictability. Um, you know, so th there was this government change in 2001, for instance, which meant that the, the government at the time chose to dismiss up to 90% of all the staff of the Ghana Nassau Petroleum Corporation because there simply wasn't any law governing some of those transitions. And that led to huge losses for the GMPC as well. Of course, the, that new government in 2000, the, the four government, brought in foreign capital and foreign expertise to replace some of the expertise that the GMPC lost at the time. But that obviously led to a lot of challenges where, for instance, um, um, Societe General, one of the um, um, advisors to GMPC at the time, was able to um, win a judgment debt against Ghana simply because Ghana didn't represent, didn't send a representative to the court at the time because there was confusion of personnel and they didn't allow things to happen in a way that was predictable and helpful. There was also, 
what we call irregular sequencing of laws where um, that, that, that cut across the board because even when there was a discovery of petroleum in 2007, the um, civil society's interest at the time in the sector was on um, revenue that, can, that came into the sector rather than on the holistic governance. Sorry, of the system, which meant that some laws were passed, which um, were not properly followed through. They didn't have appropriate um, regulations, and nobody was interested in those regulations that happened um, to push them through to happen. And, and a regulation usually is what operationalizes a law. And so if you pass a law on, let's say, um, petroleum revenue management, and you don't have a regulation for the law, it means that um, any minister or any person of implementing the law would have to use their own judgment to make sure the law stop. And in the petroleum sector, it was, it was one of the huge things that undermined implementation of laws. There is something we call sweat equity, which is um, people benefiting from the effort they take to bring in investors into the into the country. Now, Ghana doesn't have laws against sweat equity. And so if you're a politician or you're anyone who is able to bring, let's say, cosmos energy into the Ghanaian uh, space, and cosmos energy says they are giving you 2% of whatever uh, shares they are going to agree with the government, they give it to you without any, any evidence of make a financial transaction to purchase those shares. And that's a huge thing that has also afflicted the sector. Um, there's also evidence of using outdated laws, even if people knew the laws were outdated um, in the petroleum sector. Um, yeah, so these were what I consider as the cross-cutting features of the sector at the time. Now, I have attempted to um, <clears throat> analyze them along the faces. Um, to show the transition from one phase to the other and the kinds of features that um, made the period liminal. And so as a starting point, just before petroleum came on board, I've already dis discussed the, the kind of um, distress that the country went through, the socio-political decay, and the, 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 the fact that the country had to go to the IMF for um, um, a recovery program, which is not, which is intuitive, you know, <clears throat> if any country is in difficulty, they look for options. <clears throat> petroleum was one of the options and petroleum came on board. And so that phase one, when the first government, uh, the Rollins regime, the PNDC regime was still governing the sector, there were lots of um, emphasis on um, political affiliations, um, risky rent-seeking behaviors um, in the sector, um, and the extent that um, the GMPC boss at the time used his personal relationship with Rollins, the president at the time, to make um, to own the sector such that they were significant losses and the government didn't seem to worry too much about it, not because it wasn't a challenge and they didn't discredit the government, but mainly because at the time um, that personal relationship reigned supreme. Um, there were a few internal politics at the time that also disrupted the system and partly the example I gave um, where a finance minister had to um, desert the post because he didn't understand how funds, funds would go into the sector without accountability mechanisms. Then the phase two, um, there were a few other um, characteristics there, which some of which were just progressing from the first phase to the second phase. But those were, <clears throat> sorry, um, still features. The sweat equity became a big deal in the second phase. The government, <clears throat> sorry. The government changed some of the regulation, um, the strategies, but still were using outmoded laws. 
the executive arm of government was becoming very autocratic, even though we're in a democratic system. <clears throat> then in the, final, in the final phase, I would call the third phase, where there was a discovery, um, because there was a lot of capital coming in, the polit political will to bring in foreign investment was high. Unlike the first phase, <clears throat> where the government was looking inside and was more interested in using domestic re revenue than using foreign capital. Now, the, br the bringing in of foreign capital in the second phase led to discovery, which brought, brought in civil, civil society. Um, new laws were made, but I've argued that those laws were not strategically um, discussed, passed, and implemented. They were quite arbitrary, such that the interest was more on revenue management and not on holistic governance of the sector. Political interference still persisted despite all the, you know, the changes that had happened. Um, and, you know, legal frameworks were not followed through. And there's a certain sense in which um, the political will to get things done um, was more important than um, getting laws and frameworks in place. Now, this three, these three phases, uh, I've said are the, the cycle that to some extent ended the, the liminal moment. Now the post-liminal moment, which um, had from the um, all most important laws in place at the time, also still had a few challenges despite the positives. Um, laws were still made in such ways that they were not consistent and you know, regulations were not made to back laws. Um, implementers of laws were using arbitrary powers here and there. Um, it, and even when it became necessary for the right information law to be passed to help govern the space and um, 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 fast track, yeah, make the all sectors of the country, of the economy very transparent and accountable, there were still a lot of political interest to keep so many exemptions to make it almost impossible to use public interest uh, laws to get um, to get any information from the state, you know, and all those um, issues still persisted. And so that that's um, that's something worth uh, reflecting about. So the question I I, I asked in the, from the beginning was, uh, do we have a resource curse here on our hands as? Um, is being argued. Um, my answer, my simple answer is no, <clears throat> because what we see as a challenge, as a lack of um, persistent compliance with institutional design principles and frameworks, that the challenge there is not peculiar to the petroleum sector. <clears throat> in fact, the, the, in this study, I, I interviewed um, a cross section of people in petroleum sector and mining sector as well. Um, but the, the, the features are almost the same across the board. And what I've argued is that the, the challenges of institutional design is what influence the petroleum sector and not the other way around. You know, so um, yeah, the problem is not a resource problem, but an institutional design problem. And I've put, a, I've put a quote here from a community member um, whom we spoke to in one of the petroleum extraction communities. And the point is very clear that from the childhood, this person, even before petroleum became part of the resource in the sector, um, political participation has always been a problem. People's voices are not taken into account. And in, the, in this person's own voice, um, each one for themselves, you know. And in the end, whether you lament or make complaints, um, the government doesn't care. That's the point. And it, it's not because there's petroleum in that community, but it's more a challenge of how motivational complexities are addressed, whether um, institutions are sensitive to people's needs. And it's also a question of whether opportunities and incentives really influence behavior and you know, whether filters work. And so if there are elections, for instance, that 
don't lead to outcomes that reflect the majority's perspectives, you are still going to have the same challenge of institutional de design anomalies. And so it, 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 petroleum could be a problem, but it's not really the problem. It's rather institutional design issues. And so um, just to be sure <clears throat> I'm not um, exhausting my time, I've proposed um, a few um, uh, reflections on, um, I'm sure I've exhausted my time anyway. Um, but forgive me, Dr. Eka. The, a few reflections on how to deal with some of the <clears throat> issues of limin liminal governance to heighten predictability in the sector. One thing that's very clear from the evidence is that civil society is very potent in bringing voices. And in fact, in um, civil society has been very active since the 1980s to get political change where we had to move from. Ghana had to transition from authoritarian regime to a civilian regime because of civil society activism. And so there's potential for civil society and other non-state actors to make it politically unattractive for politicians to, um, to exploit the resource sector. How they do that um, is part of the questions we can begin to ask and answer. <clears throat> but obviously they are very potent because there's something that's called um, the social license to operate, which the government and multinational companies are aware of, that they are only able to govern properly if people give them legitimacy. And if there's no legitimacy, they can't function. Civil society can make sure they are using the social license very well. Um, parliament would have some role to play here so that it's not just the passage of laws, but also oversight to make sure the laws are passed, that regulations back the laws, and that they are actually implemented. Um, there's this sweat equity I mentioned, where um, people bring in investors and are able to get a cut of the shares without making any investment. There's no law in Ghana governing sweat equity. It's not illegal, but they, so it either has to be abolished. So that if you are going to have shares, there are examples, I don't want to mention names because I don't have enough time to explain them. If you are going to get shares in the petroleum sector, there has to be evidence that you've made payments, you've made a commitment. Then if you have not, and sweat equity is still going to be used, where you use your sweat to get shares in the petroleum sector, then there has to be regulations about how it's done. Um, and a few other suggestions that I've provided. <clears throat> which when you, if you read the, um, the main paper, one of the main papers I've published on this, you could have some other reflections there. Um, for now, um, I would like to end here um, with an apology to Dr. Eka for exceeding my time, but um, hopefully, um, yeah, I'm happy to respond to questions as they come along. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for that uh, very rich presentation, reflection on your research. Really appreciate uh, that and really look forward to the conversation uh, to come. Um, we've lost a little bit of time already with my own incident. So please let me welcome Kafui. Kafui, please come and offer us some comments and let's take some questions um, after Kafui's comments. Let's do it that way. Uh, colleagues, please, in the meantime, as I said, we have a Q&A function here. Do please pop your questions in uh, for me to pick up as Kafu is ending so that we make the best use of our time. Thank you so much, K Clement. Over to you, uh, Kafu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eka. And um, thank you very much, Clement, also for the reflections on um, oil government. Um, so that was an interesting one. Um, um, from my reading of your paper, it's better to interrogate how Basically, political settlement and uh, political will the new to damage the petroleum industry. Uh, and um, whether or not this undermines the functioning of good institutional um, formation or performance. Um, yes, rightly so. Um, oil exploration in Ghana uh, began some, sometime in the 1960s. 
um, century eating something by the British. Kafui, um, sorry, sorry to interject. I'm so sorry. We can't make, we can't hear you. Um, hello. Hello. Yes, I, I can't hear you properly. Please. Okay. I'm not hello. sure why that is. Uh, hello. Am yes, I, I hear you now? now. Perhaps if you speak up okay. or speak. If you stay, um, can you be closer to the microphone or something? I'm not sure what it is. Okay. Thank you. All right. It is better now so that I can, I, I think I'm, I'm fairly positioned stable. So if, if it's fine now, we can take it off. Yes, car carry on. I think that's improved. I think that's improved. Good. Thank you. So as I was saying, so Ghana's exploration um, for the quest of oil started in the late 19th century. But then intensified in the 70s then, after the economic shock and then uh, got this um, unreliability of um, oil supplies. So um, that, that was the genesis um, uh, behind the modern era of um, the oil exploration when Ghana felt that um, it couldn't rely on neighbors and um, partners to supply it with oil to kind of transform its economy in the early 1980s. So then it had to take some form of radical steps. Uh, this was actually part of the economic recovery program. And so if you refer to the Ministry of Economic and um, Finance and Economic Planning Bulletin of April 1991, you see that the government uh, at the time made it um, an integral part of the economic um, recovery program, in, which was signed with the between most institutions in 83, that um, oil exploration was going to receive a step forward towards improving the prospect for hydrocarbon exploration and development in Ghana. Um, the government also saw it as a form of modernizing the sector to enable the Ghana National Petroleum Company assume responsibility for more exploration to aid in the development and production. So while we would see that um, the period between the 1980s up to the early 2000s. The focus by the government of Ghana was basically on generating enough data to support the um, drilling and prospecting of oil. Because prior to this, there was very little um, data to support this, even though the prospects were there, 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 there was very little, very little seismic and um, geodetic data available to help any multinational or um, indigenous company in the sector to make any serious investment. And with the assistance of the UNDP, there were collaborations with um, Petrobras of, um, of Brazil. There was collaboration with the Canadian oil company. There was collaboration with Chevron and Shell. There was also collaboration with the uh, National Oil Company of Japan to improve on the data availability um, that would lead to oil exploration, the final part of the oil exploration. Thankfully, this data came alive in the mid 2000s with um, the EO group and Cosmos getting um, the first discovery of oil in commercial quantities. And so from this, um, you realize that what actually led to the boom in Ghana's um, oil uh, industry was not really um, entirely the effort of local institutions, but it took a collaboration of both um, local and foreign um, interests in pursuing actively the desire to start oil. For this to happen. And therefore, I mean, one, one draw of this paper that uh, one comes to easily is the thinking that uh, national actors and institutions should be credited or blamed for the successes or otherwise of failures at the national level. Um, this thinking ignores that um, together with the economic recovery program, many economies began to be integrated in the neoliberal economy and then post 2000 in a more corporatized economy where the product of national policies are heavily influenced by international, ideational and um, 
other interests and factors. And so this must be um, taken into deep consideration when trying to explore some of these institutional arrangements that um, uh, define the way in which we govern some of our national species. Um, there is an emphatic statement that um, the governance of the petroleum sector had transformed from limited species to more uh, counterbalanced and predictable institutional framework. And it, there is no question in doubt that the institution set up right from the PNDC era had um, huge amounts of integrity in trying to establish um, uh, or set the conditions for oil exploration and management in commercial countries. Indeed, um, the author sought to highlight a personal um, interest or yes, personal interest in, in trying to either get GNPC effective or not. Indeed, GNPC were, was manned mainly by technical persons who were seconded from the petroleum department that was set up, that has been in existence right from um, the, the last couple of years before independence, around the 1950s, so the late 70s. So when GNPC was set up, the, the staff, technical staff of the Department of Petroleum were seconded to the Ghana National Petroleum Council. So again, this is an institution that transcended any individual's choice or um, individual external interest. It was basically a state institution where there were more of civil servants than um, political appointees. Indeed, the work of the GNPC itself was under the supervision of the, um, what was called the Secretariat of Mines and Energy, or now the Ministry of Energy. Then under the PNDC, it was the Department of Mines and Power. Now it is the Ministry of Energy. So again, there was um, executive oversight responsibility. Indeed, besides the GNPC Act that was established by PNDC Law 80, I should think, the activities of GNPC as a commercial entity was again, regulated by the Companies Act 1960, which until 2019 was the overall regulatory framework for any commercial entity in foreign or local operating in Ghana. So again, it tells you that as much as the Companies Act might not have anticipated certain things uh, or certain occurrences or institutional arrangements that um, characterize the oil sector post oil discovery in commercial countries, there were indeed institutional, internal institutional arrangements to ensure checks and balances. Um, yes, and I think right from that also, you could see an attempt to um, say to romanticize the current governance arrangement as though it was better than the period between the 1980s and the early 2000s. Indeed, that was a period where, uh, besides uh, the UNDP and the Pan Indian government, and perhaps to some extent, Petrobras, there was very um, limited interest, um, even from the World Bank uh, itself. Indeed, the World Bank's um, interest in Ghana's uh, power sector was in some way ignited by local um, efforts. For example, when it comes to governance, for example, um, it took the effort of um, a coalition of civil society operators in the oil and gas sector in the early 2000s to actually um, come out with uh, their own sort of a policy blueprint to uh, manage the, or to kind of um, shape policy in the oil and gas management which actually led to the World Bank now showing active interest in, in, in that sector. But also prior to that, the government of Jericho for itself had organized um, um, a conference, um, Oil and Gas for National Development in 2008. I think it was held at the M Plaza and these are one of them, uh, which brought in uh, a lot of um, institutions, including the Norwegian government to try and um, 
help Ghana fashion out uh, appropriate laws towards that. And most of this culminated in uh, the Petroleum Re Revenue Management Act and other transparency initiative acts that were enacted between the period of 2011 and 2016. And again, if, if, even if there were incidents of um, uh, lack of transparency, uh, it, 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 was, it was part of, um, um, Ghana wasn't a one of country in that aspect, uh, given that until 2003, when Ghana ascended to be a member of the um, trans, of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, I mean, it, it, it had no international obligation as such. Um, that isn't to say that um, whatever infractions had happened um, should have been allowed to go back. We would even come to see later on that even an attempt to demonize the GMPC by the succeeding new patriotic party didn't um, really achieve its purpose if one would have to go with the judgment delivered by the Supreme Court in overturning the um, eight-year-old case that led to the incarceration of its former um, CEO, Mr. Chachichikata, for causing financial loss to the state. The Supreme Court judgment that overturned it, that uh, actually quashed that case as null and void, said that the GMPC had not done anything worthy or its intention were never to cause financial loss indeed. We show that um, at the end of it, it is more about elite interest in capturing the spaces other than institutional designs. There is a different having institutional mechanisms and, uh, and another thing having elite commitment and willingness to ensure that these uh, designs meet their set objectives. Indeed, even civil society itself is not an apolitical entity within the space. Um, if you draw up all the civil society organizations, one can easily trace where their sources of funding are coming from, and that alone shapes the kind of interest that that the advance within that space. So it is very important for us to also not treat civil society as um, a disinterested party in, in this particular space. Um, so, so, so that is, I think, um, and I think one last thing that um, I would want to highlight is that the author also stated a hypothesis which, um, I think the study didn't really either address or didn't even touch on. I, I didn't find um, the author addressing the hypothesis. So in a nutshell, I would want to say that indeed, um, there is a tendency to uh, there's a tendency to overplace the importance of um, personal interest within the broader institutional framework of governance in the country. But it is important for us in doing that to actually look at how institutional arrangements are made more effective outside of elite interest and elite settlement. That's to me, it's a very important thing that we need to look at. And in trying to do that, we would have to analyze some of these occurrences from a non-partisan and non-political perspective because then it doesn't help us to actually go to the core of the issues than to rather highlight the partisan aspects that cloud the institutional effectiveness and the efficiency of some of these institutions. Um, having said that, um, thank you very much, Clement, for this work. Uh, I think it would, it would still um, go a long way to enhance the debate about natural resource governance and development in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very insightful set of remarks, uh, Kafui. I think that goes a long way also to enrich uh, our conversations. As Kafui has said, Clement, thank you so much for doing the work um, and sharing it with us. So, you know, we heard there from, from Clement about this significant, so A, I think we have to think of the context where, 
he's uh, problematizing, challenging this tendency to reduce any complexities in resource um, exporting uh, economies as down to a natural resource curse, a natural resource curse thesis. I think many of us here will be aware of that thesis that just says actually the presence of natural resources is really the issue uh, without going to greater depth about this. But many in this space have worked around this thinking about governance questions and Clements has really centered on that highlighting the significance of this notion this idea of liminality which I'm quite curious about and you know this change a space of change of a lot of dynamism a lot of movement and and asking what a focus on those spaces says to us uh, about what is actually going on with natural resource uh, governance and is centered on uh, institutional design and I think has done a great job sort of unpacking that uh, for us to to reflect on so thank you so much for that we've heard now from uh, Kafui who is uh, you know who's who's drawing our attention also to history right to what has brought us to where we are uh, today of course we know what there's a lot of especially in development discourse a lot of focus on institutions but those institutions can be very long in the making um, they can be very defined by certain path dependencies by many things that have gone on before and Kafu is calling our attention to that also uh, reflecting on uh, you know a, a period the post-independence period where and I think this is quite important it's critical I think of the work of Tandikan Kandawire who often says the way we think of institutions today uh, is divorced is divorced from a particular reality in the post-independence period, a period of promise, if you like. And Kafui draws attention to that uh, in our minds. I think that's a very useful basis to reflect on. Kafui is also asking the extent to which we can disentangle questions about institu institutional design from sort of elite interests. And Clement, you also reflect on this in the conversation about political settlements um, as well. So I think a lot of rich material for us to reflecting to reflect on um, now. Now I have a plethora of questions here. You see how fascinating this talk has been and these comments have also uh, been. Clement, I think you should have access to this, but I'll try and and go through them uh, as well. Also, I'll try and see if I can group some together. Some of these actually, Kafui also uh, spoke about. The first one we have here, and I'm especially curious about this, um, is, is a point that's made about historical trends in Ghana and realities in Nigeria, because we often hear about, you know, Ghana has the privilege of learning uh, from what has gone on in other spaces. You reference Nigeria a lot in your talk, what space of exchange has there been there? I saw somewhere here that this question was from Ife. I very much hope it is from, it is from uh, the, I don't know if it's the Ife we know. Um, I was excited to, to see that and to just say, welcome Ife, wonderful uh, to hear from you uh, on this, you yourself work on, on, on some of these uh, issues. So um, Clement, think of that. Let me add two more and uh, uh, you begin with that while we have an, a next collection. Um, a very good point here uh, from Munia uh, about the role of civil society and Kafui touches on this, how uh, so civil society themselves are not apolitical. So the idea that simply expanding the space for their influence uh, ought to support and help institutional design, can we just take that for granted, right? Munia is saying, um, you know, civil society does not necessarily lead to better governance outputs, but at times can serve the interests of their funders. This is, you know, this is a discourse that, uh, you know, is well researched as well. So please, if you take that on, um, on board as well, that would be useful. I see another point here about the active involvement of civil society and how useful that involvement has been in shaping petroleum governance um, to date. Any challenges there? I think that links to Munir's. Uh, point as well. Um, a final point from Raham I'm seeing here that you can take in this collection. Um, uh, she makes the point, I believe it's uh, she, uh, bear with me, if not, uh, that liminal features refer to laws and disconnect with local people. Um, one way forward that suggested is decentralization, yet we find more blockages within these interventions in other natural resource governance processes. And is saying to us here, uh, I think this links to, well, sort of thinking of that history, the extent to which the colonial project, 
has influenced some of these processes. Can we divorce this from history? Kafui mentioned post-independence. Rahama, Rahama is actually saying uh, the colonial period. Where does that fe feed in uh, to all of this? But also this question about the disconnect with uh, local people and suggestions about decentralization. Does that give you enough to work on for now, Clement? Is that all right? 100%, 100%. Good, thank you. Let's take yes. that and come back to the next. Colleagues, thank yeah. you so much for these wonderful, wonderful comments and questions. Thank you. Yeah, very, very insightful questions there. Um, can you all hear me all right? Excellent. Look, these are very, very useful um, <clears throat> reflections and questions, which um, um, if, I, we have to, if you have to engage with even one of those questions, it could take us the whole day. Um, before I come to Ife and Munya and Rahama, um, just one quick response to the question of coloniality. And I think it also speaks to some of those other points of uh, um, decentralization and the, the, the factors that stifle its effectiveness. Um, it's important to note that this, the extent to which colonialism plays a part in our current political discourse is very debatable. There are many, many, many credible schools of thought that say everything Africa is now, blame it on colonialism, which is fair, you know, because you can't forget the history of um, um, extraction during colonialism and post-colonial uh, manipulation of systems in Africa. So 100%. Um, there are also others who argue, uh, and um, there's this scholar, if you are keen to read about, I think it's Frederick Cooper, who is very clear that African governments, African leaders, and even African people during the struggle for independence had a lot of agency to influence the discourse. Um, no matter how small that is, um, there were, the fact that people were able to struggle to attain independence suggests that there was agency in the process. The extent to which post-independence post governments should be blamed for their rot vis-a-vis the, the, the colonial government's own uh, post-colonial ma ma machinations are debatable and uh, can clearly be put on the table. But usually when I define institutional design, um, I try to categorize the thinking so that we are portioning agency where it's feasible, but also looking into the future to say what can be altered to make the future better. Because if we, are, if we keep blaming colonialism for everything, then we can as well forget about this whole discussion because then colonialism is the problem. So how do we deal with that? That's another conversation. How do we deal with that becomes a problem in the context of globalization and the fact that we are all intertwined in a space where it's difficult to separate um, one from the other. So a fair point, you know, we, we cannot discuss institutional design alone without having that uh, historical context. But it's also important to look at the future and say, if you want to define what you can alter, then let's, let's look at that framework of um, institutional design. So yes, um, I, I just wanted to touch on that before I forget. Now, historical trends in, in Ghana and Nigeria, definitely the history of Nigeria has informed some of the lessons that Ghana had. For instance, when um, petroleum was discovered, and I guess that's one of the reasons why civil society jumped upon the wagon to say, let's have revenue management law as a starting point without even looking at other things to say, so, and so that in Ghana at the moment, the government doesn't have access to all the revenue that comes from petroleum. It only has just about 30% for budgetary support and the others go to all other kinds of um, funds, um, which is a lesson from Nigeria's case where some of these initial arrangements were not available and government had you know, you know, a, a wholesale money to use for other things. So definitely an important lesson. Of course, Ghana's own history of gold mining and prospecting, and the fact that the country has not benefited from gold um, also informed its attitude towards the petroleum management. And I, everyone agrees that at least to a very large extent, despite all the, despite the fact that Ghana still has just about 13 to 15% of shares in petroleum um, in Ghana, um, the management of the sector is much, much better than the country managed this gold um, sector. Um, so that's, that's just to put that on the table. Um, it's civil society, 100%. In fact, in some of my publications, I've said, and the one publication just before this one on um, um, the, um, the interaction between the state and society, I've always argued 
that civil society is not egalitarian. It's not just some obje objective body sitting there doing the public good. It is a collection of human beings who have their own interests and they have to be funded for their activities. And government will not fund civil society to criticize it, you know, so they have to look for, fund, for money elsewhere, you know. So all those things come to play in defining what civil society is. But do we have a better alternative to the pro, uh, something that projects the voice of ordinary people better than civil society? I have not seen any, you know. Um, no matter how we try to distill it to go down into the granular communities to say, let's, let's go to the communities and speak with them, you still have to engage with collection of people who represent a certain constituency. Um, and so that subjectivity and serving the interests of the masters in Europe and Americas have obviously defined how um, civil society works. In fact, there's some, some paper I'm working on, which um, is looking at the, um, the class between civil society um, um, hubs in Ghana's petroleum sector, where recently there was, you know, a, a, so a lot of um, disagreement between the leading members of Ghana civil society group on oil and gas or something, where one was speaking for a multinational oil company on public platform, very big platforms, and another was speaking against it despite the fact that they had an agreement in their own meetings, you know, of a, an approach towards the issue against the government and the multinational oil company. They came up and out and had a class on public platforms. Definitely there are issues, you know, but the question then still comes down to, is there an alternative? Civil society has been very influential in determining a certain level of predictability and accountability and, and transparency in the petroleum sector. Accountability hasn't, been achieved yet, but transparency 100%. At least there's some activity, activism happening there, which is very important. Now, the last question from, and I've, I think I've responded to Ife and Munya. Um, I think Rahama had something on um, liminality. Yeah, the liminality really uh, is just, you know, if you think about liminality as part uh, in the context of transitions, and I've said, like, you know, it, every transition in life from childhood to puberty, puberty, from um, an adult, from adolescence to adulthood, from a sing, being a single person to a married person, there's always that transition from, from being a young person to a, a, an old person or even transition to death. There's always that confusion that happens that really um, it, it affects how things are planned properly. And if you don't emerge from that transition, it's always catastrophic. You know, if you stay in the cycle of identity crisis, which will be resolved by the time you are 20 years, that is going to cause problems for you when you are 40, unless you resolve it carefully. So that liminality, that, those liminal moments um, stayed with Ghana's petroleum sector for a long time. And of course, it meant that um, in the initial stages, civil society and non-state actor voices were silent just because there was no clarity on what who is doing. Um, so that's the, the liminal space I've defined. And decentralization is an important solution to this, not because decentralization can do away with liminal movements, because liminal movements are also important part of the progress um, in every institution or every, every way of life. But if decentralization have to, has to work, um, there has to be political will. And one of the things I've argued elsewhere is that an important determinant to a viable institution is the political will to get the institutions to work, the political will to listen to civil society or ordinary members, the political will to be on the table and take on what's, taking, uh, what's discussed around the table. Decentralization is always difficult and no politician except a few would want to see a, a credible, authentic decentralization. Um, and until there's a political will to make sure it works, it's going to be very difficult and always, you know, we have to discuss and see what we can do to get um, civil society to act. And but one, one way of doing that is to make sure members of society are utilizing what I'm calling the social license. The social license they deliver to the state. If, they, if the society says, you, the state doesn't have a license to operate in our space or the civil, or multinational oil companies, even though they have their license to come here to explore and extract, 
we will not give them the peace of mind to do their work. That the license that they can withhold or acquiesce, you know, to multinational companies or to the state. And that always civil society can play a part in making sure that works um, well there. Um, hopefully I've responded to all the questions, but please um, bring them back if I've left any of them out. Thank you so much for those uh, um, responses to those very, very rich questions, uh, uh, Clement. Now, we have a few moments left, um, so I'm going to try and pick up questions that have not been addressed just yet. Alexa, I see your question, which is a big one about, you know, uh, uh, Clement. Are, are you endorsing this focus on institutions as the key space for thinking about how one you know deals with natural resource management that the focus on institutions this is where um, we need to pay attention to this is what we need to focus on um, there's a question from Catherine about the influence of foreign investors on Ghana's national institutions if we touched on this briefly um, any key points you want to drop um, uh, around that um, from uh, Shweke here, uh, we see a question, you referred to the Gulf of Guinea and uh, other international actors, and uh, the question there is uh, the focus on the 80s, 90s, and think of the Gulf of Guinea as a whole, and Africa and international actors, do you still see those broader influence on, on Ghana's petroleum governance today? And if you do, how? Uh, okay, there's a question here touching on institutional design um comparing the us and the uk um uh, attendee please bear with me if we wrap up on these others and have a moment we'll come back to that uh, otherwise we'll find other means to to return to you on that uh, clement can i drop those with you see how you want to deal mm. with those what you can manage in the time we have left thank you yeah yeah thank you um yes um I think I probably start with the, the first one, whether I'm endorsing institutions as key to deal with uh, natural resource management. And I, I think um, this brings me really to the question of um, what institutions, I know we talk about institutional design, are we talking about formal intentional designs or institutions that just emerge from sociocultural practices, history, the history of people living together in peace. And I think, um, that's a debate we can have. It's a whole debate we can discuss the whole day. For now, I'm saying um, in terms of the focus of this particular research, I've been interested in formal intentional designs of institutions that also take into account existing informal systems. However you look at it, you need a certain framework to think about um, the petroleum governance sector and that formal institutions are important. Um, so the influence of foreign investors in Ghana's sector, 100% very influential. Um, the fact that Cosmos came to Ghana um, up upon the invitation of a certain group called EO Group, and also Cosmos was able to give about, I think, 3% of the shares of, um, of, um, of that petroleum um, discovery to that company without any objection, speaks volumes. Of course, it means that those EU group had political uh, connection and everything, but they are very important. If they decide not to abide by the laws of the country, there's going to be a challenge. Um, in the, around 2010, there was some oil spillage and you know, the government wanted uh, the Cosmos also to, to clear the, the spillage. They said there's no law that said they should take responsibility for that. And that, but of course, that wasn't their their um their fault because the government the, the law the laws didn't exist. And that's why I speak about illogical sequencing. You are thinking about how to get manage revenue, but you don't think about how to manage the environment that the revenue is coming from. Because there were no laws to govern all these things. But multinational com oil companies always have they bring the money, they have influence, and they have a lot of um, say there. But of course, I, I'm always more careful when I'm apportioning responsibilities. I think the state has a responsibility to make sure the laws are working. Whether multinationals want to abide by it or not is another question. That's another thing that we need to talk about. Um, yes, I think that the, the wider um, ecosystem of international organizations and, uh, and countries having interest in the Gulf of Guinea very uh, important. Um, obviously, because of, like I've said, the globalization and the way 
countries interact these days. And the fact that crude is mined in Ghana, but sold in the London, stock, uh, London or somewhere else speaks about how these um, international factors have a lot of um, stake there. But I think I've exhausted my time. I didn't get a question about compare the US and UK uh, comparison there. Um, but I mean, I, I think I've probably exhausted my time there. If the, if clarity comes in there, I'm happy to respond. Thank you. Uh, yes, that was from uh, Momin, and in, in, um, you know, from from the uh, team here. Uh, yeah, bear yeah, with yeah. us, Momin. Yeah. We have we'll have Clement with us, and we will pick up on this um, in a bilateral. So bear with us there. Um, we are at uh, midday, uh, so I, I, it's left for me to just say a huge, huge thank you to our presenter, of course, Clement. That was really fascinating, wonderful to hear about that work and to see where it goes, because I think there's a lot of futures thinking you reflected mm. on their agency, what, what will come. And I really appreciate that focus. Kafui, thank you so much for that critical bend to things, linking also with uh, uh, some of the fascinating questions that have come from uh, from the the audience uh, as well there, reminding us to think of structures, reminding us to think of histories, um, and also pointing to a different period in, in, in Ghana and how that may be influencing what we see today. Of course, I didn't uh, reflect on what you said about the place of neoliberalism and the stranglehold of neoliberalism. How can we talk about institutions today without reflect? How can we complain about what we see here? We don't reflect on the major influence neoliberalism has also had there. I really appreciate um, uh, th those contributions. And of course, to all of you that tuned in to watch this with us, so, so grateful for joining us. The level of interaction and engagement, those incredible, insightful questions and remarks and comments. Thank you so much for all of those from friends from today and from the past. It's wonderful to see and hear from you there. Thank you so much. Let me sign off by also saying we have a next seminar on the 22nd of November at the same time online as well. Uh, titled Leadership, Nation Building and War in South Sudan, is going to be discussing aspects of a new book from Dr. Sonia Theron. So do please join us for that. More information will be coming out to all of you um, on that as well. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day, rest of the week, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, next time. Look after yourselves. Goodbye. <laughs>